Good morning, church. This morning, we will be looking at the prophet Amos. And if you would, please bow with me for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come to you, bowing to you, thanking you for your word, thanking you that we have this opportunity to come and study. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be subservient to you and to your word. Help us to use it to guide our lives. Forgive us for we fail you. In this in Jesus' dear name that we pray. Amen. Was hoping to get to the next one, but uh, okay, here's where I want to be. I'd like to start out by taking a look at Amos. Amos is somewhat of a unique prophet in that some of the things we see about him, he prophesied. Approximately 760 B.C. We see there is a window of prophecy because he talks about when he prophesied. Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam II was the king of Israel. Now, Uzziah began his reign in 767 B.C. and Jeroboam the second ended his in 753 BC, so we know it has to be in that window somewhere, and that's the reason I say approximately 760. Uh, a few other things: he was from Tekoa, which is approximately 10 miles south of Jerusalem. That means he was of the country of Judah. His occupation was a shepherd. And we see in the scripture also that he tended sycamore, fig trees, what, a side job maybe. And he lived in a relatively peaceful and prosperous time the inhabitants had gone through a lot of problems. It had been, life had been hard, but they were living in relatively prosperous times now. Uh, and part of that was due to the fact that just as we saw in Jonah, that Nineveh had repented, Assyria, who had been at their doorstep, who had been troubling them for a good long time, now has stopped for a period. So things have kind of let up a little. And while he was from Judah, his prophecy was to Israel. We see in as we start out the chapter in 1-1. One, one. And let me go back. I'm not doing much good there. Yeah, okay. I want to take a look first at, you see on the screen, who or what Israel is. And the reason I want us to consider this is because when Israel is mentioned here 
in Amos, we need to understand what we're talking about. We see Israel described here, starting out to be Israel, the man who was Jacob. And we see scripture for that in Genesis. We see Israel described as the family, the family of Jacob. And also in Exodus, we see Israel described as the nation. And we see the nation as a part of a nation because we had the split between Judah and Israel. And then finally, we see elsewhere, and we're going to see in chapter 9, Israel is described as the spiritual nation or the kingdom. And again, the reason I bring this up is because many denominations around us seem to be lacking on their understanding of Israel as the spiritual nation. And we will get into that a little more as we go on because there is a very big problem in what they teach that is try, they try to hold everything literal when in reality it is figurative as we've just seen Adam present in the study we have done on Revelation. Now, let's get into this. Let's see if I can get down to the last slide here. There we go. And this is the outline of Amos. And as we go into this, we see that in chapter 1, the first part of chapter 1 is an introduction. And as we get into 3, we, we see that things get serious, really serious for Israel. And We start out in verse 3 of 1, and it talks about the coming judgment of the nations. And it's the nations not only well, We see that the, the nations surrounding Israel and Judah have lived in such a manner as to persecute Judah and Israel. They have been a real problem. And we go through each one of these. And let's see. I'll get to my right spot here in a minute. We see that the nations are called out. Syria is mentioned first as we look in verses 3 to 5, and as we go to verses 6 through 8, we see that the Philistines are mentioned. And in 9 through 10, we see Tyre. We see Edom mentioned in 11 through 12. 
Ammon is mentioned in 13 through 15. Moab in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And don't think we stop here because these have been the nations without. Now we're going to talk about the condemnation of the nations within. Judah is mentioned in chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And then we start with Israel. And this is one brief mention in verses 6 through 16 of chapter 2. And then we're going to go on to talk about the sins of Israel as we look in the second section, Israel's condemnation for their sins, their punishment, and as always, God always holds out one little bit of hope. There is a way out. But unfortunately for them, and also God knows, they will not take it. They will be ultimately destroyed. They will be, those that are not killed will be taken into captivity. And Israel as a nation, we will never see again. They will become part of what is Assyria. Now, the irony I thought of the whole thing, here is Israel taken into captivity, becoming part of Assyria. They've gone through this once. Now that they become part of Assyria, their descendants that have become part of Assyria are going to be annihilated again when Syria is taken by Babylon. So, hardship and more hardship on top of it for one simple reason. And that is they have turned their back on God. And as we go through Amos, we're going to see all of these things pointed out again and again. Here's what you're going to suffer. Here's why you're going to suffer. Now, Israel as a nation got off to an extremely poor start. You know when Israel as a nation split, Rehoboam was the king. Judah and Benjamin stuck to Rehoboam. And I don't think all of Benjamin, but part of it. But the rest of the tribes went with Jeroboam. Now, the big problem was Jeroboam was afraid of the worship because the worship was to be at Jerusalem, which was in Judah. And he feared that if everybody went back to Jerusalem to worship, sooner or later they would turn back to God and to, to Rehoboam. So what does he do? He sets up his own place of worship in Bethel. Now, this was against what God desired. So from the very start, 
Israel was doomed unless they turned from the way they were headed. And Jeroboam really added to their burden. Now, we have gone from that period. We are approximately 200 years later to the time of Rehoboam II. They have gone through many kings. Times have been very hard. They have suffered much. But they will not turn. And let's take a look at some of the things we see. Uh, let's take a look at... I'm going to read a few verses here. In 3.1... Is where I'm going to start. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. God has been faithful to them but they haven't been faithful to him. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to me? Does a lion roar in the midst, in the forest, when he has no prey? And it goes on here. Let's see. Let's take a look at verse 10 if you would, because here's where they are. This really explains exactly. It says, they do not know how to do right, declares the Lord. They are so caught up in their life, in doing what they do, and we're going to see a number of their sins spoken of here the oppression of the poor the, ste the stealing the cheating the false worship one thing after another and let's see in verse 13 hear and testify against the house of Jacob declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, that on the day I punish Israel for his transgressions, I will punish the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will strike the winter housing along with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. Think what they've done. There has been a cast in Israel that has become very rich at the expense of the poor. The poor have become poorer and the rich have become richer. Uh, not a new idea that we see today, even though we see this very thing going on. But here is what they have been doing, and they have been oppressing the poor to become richer. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, Bashan who are on the mountain of Samaria who oppress the poor and crush the needy who say to their your husbands bring that we may drink the Lord God has sworn in his holiness 
and behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, even the last of you with fish hooks. And you shall go out through the breaches, each one straight ahead, and you shall be cast out into Armand declares the Lord. Times are going to be hard because Assyria is going to make it that way. Assyria is at bay for a time, but they will rise up against Israel and will crush them. And here's part of the reason why we see what they are doing, there is no justice in Israel. There is no righteous worship in Israel. They put on the show, but it is simply that. It is a show. Now, you heard me say, God still holds out a glimmer of hope for them. And look in chapter 5. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel forsaken on her land with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live but do not seek Bethel why false worship there is no hope at Bethel and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba for Gilgal shall surely go into exile and Bethel shall come do nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness. To the earth. Here is the point that they have come to. There is nothing good, nothing righteous within Israel at this time. And still God, through the prophet, seeks them to turn. We see also as in verses 6 through 11 of chapter 4, we see that there are many trials, but Israel would not turn to God. Let, let me read this because uh, I gave you cleanness of teeth, in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places yet you did not turn to me declares the Lord I also withheld the rain from you when there were yet 
three months to the harvest, I would send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field would have rain, and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would wander to another city to drink water and would not be satisfied. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. I struck you with blight and mildew, your many gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locusts devoured, yet you did not return to me. Now, they've suffered all of these trials, all of these hardships. You know, let me kind of bring this back to today. We see many people who go out and live their life as they please. And the minute they get in trouble and hardship approaches, and it, it could be a medical hardship, it could be a hardship of finances, it could be all kinds of things. The minute they get in trouble, of course, the first place they turn. Oh, God, won't you help me? I'm having all kinds of trouble. I want to live my life like I live it, but then I want you to help me. And we find that rather offensive because it's either you follow God or you don't follow God. You enjoy its benefits or you don't enjoy its benefits. But I want you to see something here in this scripture that we just read. God has sent hardship upon Israel. And he expected Israel to turn to him because of what their suffering was. But even with this suffering, they would not turn to him. God expects us to turn to him when we suffer hardship. The scripture shows, even with Israel, in the situation they were in, he expected them to turn to it. But they didn't. They suffered. And they went on doing what they do. What they want to do. So, keep that in mind. We need to always look to God and even more so when times are hard. But they refuse to, period. Would not. As we, let's see. Let's take a look in chapter 6, verse, and we'll start in verse 1. And, you know, I... I had made the statement earlier, there was a cast. Uh, there was a rich group, and they preyed on the poor group. And take a look here. A line that we often see and use, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. We can't stand good times because when we stand, when we do have good times, our tendency is to think that we created them and we wander away from God. Here is a group that had good times. They thought they were secure in where they were, are, where they were and who they are. But we need to realize just as Israel was not secure, neither are we. We can have a million dollars one day and good health, and we can be broken in the hospital the next. 
that is the frailty of our lives. And that's what Israel is going to discover shortly. And let's see. Oh, you who put away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile. And ultimately they were. Israel was first. The difference being Israel didn't come out. Judah who went in later didn't come out. Now, as we move along into chapter 7, we see Amos' vision of warning and ultimately from that, from his telling Israel what he saw, what's going to happen, that didn't set too well with those of Israel. And let's take a look at that. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, he was forming locusts when the latter growth was just beginning to sprout. And behold, it was the latter growth after the king's mowing when they had finished eating the grass of the land, I said, the Lord relented. And I said, O Lord God, please forgive. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord God was calling the judgment by fire, and it devoured the great deep and was eating up the land when I said, O Lord God, cease. How can Jacob stand? He is so small. The Lord Relented concerning this, this also shall not be, said the Lord God. This is what he showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Here's what's coming. He relented twice 
but here is the final word. And then Amaziah, the high priest of Bethlehem, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear or to hear to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. Confrontation with Amaziah. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethlehem. For it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. And Amos answered and said to I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, O prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line, you yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from this land. Pretty simple. Here's what's going to happen. Now, again and again and again, we see the same thing spoken by Amos. At the desire of God to Israel. And we see in one verses 1 through 14 that Israel will continue in their sins until the day of destruction and mourning. And they will not turn they are set on their course. And God knows that they are set on their course, but still he sends warnings to them. Uh, in verses 1, in chapter 9, verses 1 through 10, we see the destruction of Israel spoken of. And then we get to the break. The break in chapter 9, verse 11, and following through 15. And when I say the break, I don't know whether your Bible has a heading at the top of verse 11. The restoration of Israel. Now, wait a minute. If something's going to be utterly destroyed, how can you restore it? Any ideas? This? Okay. This is one of the key elements in many denominational groups' teaching 
of the millennium, the thousand-year reign. And let's take a look at this. Let's look at verse 11. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord God who does this. Now, is this physical Israel? No, it is not. This is spiritual Israel. Now, first of all, we need to decide if you're going to raise something up, and this describes it as a booth. What is a booth? Pardon? Tabernacle. Yeah, tabernacle was a booth. A booth, if you will look up the word that's used here, is a shelter. Now, when Israel, the children of Israel, came out of Egypt, and they made their way to the promised land. And they would not go in. And then they wandered in the wilderness 40 years. Where'd they live? They lived in tents, which are also known as a booth. It was their protection. Now, We are talking about the booth of David. What was, what could possibly be the protection of David? Was it not God? Did there, was there anything else that protected David? Did he have some kind of house that protected him? Yet, the false teaching will say, well, this is the nation of Israel. It's no nation. It's the booth. Now, let's talk about that for just a minute. What, besides God, what took place between God and Israel. A covenant was put in place. And this covenant, as long as they held to it, protected Israel. Now, we talk about, look at here, uh, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen. So that booth is fallen at this time. Because why? Because Israel is not adhering to it. Now, how is the booth of David going to be raised up? We have been looking at prophecy that is in the near future for Israel. Now we're going to take a look at prophecy that is going to deal with long-term future for the tribes of Israel. And that long-term future is the coming of Christ. Christ. 
here the booth will be raised up again. But it will not be in the same fashion that it was before. Remember what happened at Christ's death? The curtain that hid the Holy of Holies was ripped from top to bottom, which symbolized the fact that the first covenant was finished. The new covenant was coming into effect. Here is the booth that protects every one of us as the spiritual children of Israel. Not some thousand year reign. Now, my time is up. I do want to throw out a couple of verses for you to look at and let me let me talk about the millennium briefly it denies the existence of the kingdom that we know now it denies the king if if the kingdom doesn't exist you can't have a king and ultimately it denies the church God's church because no kingdom no church it makes Christ a liar by the claim he will have a thousand year earthly kingdom look at John 18 36 you know it but apply it my kingdom's not of this earth and finally, it fails to recognize the Jewish dispensation ended with Christ's death because they're talking about the Jews having a nation and a nation that will rule for a thousand years. If the Jewish dispensation is done, which we see was shown, how can that be? But the biggest thing there, it makes Christ a liar. So, also, take a look at Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. Because this tells exactly what we see has happened. Thank you all.